Good morning, everybody. This is Andrew Ross Sorkin, columnist at the New York Times and founder of DealBook. Welcome, and thank you for joining this week's DealBook Debrief. I'm joined, as always, by Michael Del Merced, DealBook reporter, and I should say it is his birthday today, so happy birthday to Michael. Uh, but we're also joined uh, by a very special and uh, expert reporter uh, today, David Sanger, national security correspondent for the New York Times. He is also the author of The Perfect Weapon, War, Sabotage, and Fear, in the cyber age, and we should mention that it is being made into a documentary coming this fall. And we couldn't be more privileged to spend time with David today uh, because it is such a timely topic uh, where we are in our relationship between the United States and China and so many other national security concerns that we have and how it's gonna affect the world of technology, whether it's big tech, uh, whether it's Huawei or TikTok. We'll talk about voting in the United States, Russia, and so much more. And we wanna make this as interactive as impossible. So let me uh, say in advance, please submit your questions. You can do so at any time uh, throughout this call. You can do it in the Q&A window. Uh, we should also note that this uh, conversation is being recorded. We'll make a replay available on nytimes.com. We'll put it in tomorrow's uh, newsletter and we'll push it out on social media as well. Uh, and then finally, just a reminder, this is an audio only event. So if you're looking for video, uh, it, it's not there, uh, but you can have us in, your ears. Uh, with all of that, let me welcome David to the conversation. David, thanks for joining us. Andrew, great to be with you, and um, uh, welcome from a, a rainy, a, a rainy morning in Vermont. Well, you've been uh, busy from Vermont uh, <laughs> because there's a lot of geopolitical things that are taking place, and you have a big story out uh, that we should probably use as maybe uh, a jumping off point because it, it, in many ways it's a microcosm of so many different issues that are taking place around the world and represent the national security uh, issues and questions that I think we're going to spend some time talking about. Um, maybe maybe for, for those who have not had an opportunity to read your piece today, uh, tell us what took place in Houston over the last 24 hours and what it means. Well, Andrew, two, uh, two days ago, the United States uh, indicted some Chinese hackers, not for the, the first time, uh, for hacking into uh, American companies. They also charged them with trying to get at some of the coronavirus uh, vaccine research data, which is, of course, today the most valuable intellectual property there is in the world, right, to the a uh, country that gets to a vaccine first not only goes uh, significant riches and um, and an ability uh, perhaps to protect their populations, but a good deal of power uh, as well. Um, but what was interesting about this indictment was that the hackers work for themselves and for the Ministry of State Security uh, in China, if you believe the U.S. charges, went back to 2009. Well, that tells you how long we've been dealing with uh, these kinds of issues uh, from, uh, from China as well, but not just from China. And then the next day, uh, yesterday, uh, the United States and told the Chinese that they had to close their consulate in Houston, which has been known to be a center of the Ministry of State Security's um, actions. And um, uh, almost immediately, you could see a plume of black smoke come up over the embassy. Uh, presumably the embassy employees were burning their classified uh, information because they knew that the US would come in as soon as uh, the embassy or the consulate was, was evacuated. Um, so uh, that was also a little bit familiar. What I wrote about today was asking the question, does any of this work? I mean, we've been indicting Chinese hackers, Russian hackers, Iranian hackers, North Korean hackers for years now. Uh, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration has closed diplomatic facilities belonging to uh, Russia uh, back in 2017 and, and now to China. And yet there is very little evidence that any of this actually deters the kind of behavior that we are presumably trying to stop which raises the question, why is deterrence failing in the cyber arena? And what, what do you think the answer to that is? And what do you think the solution to that is? Well, the, in the uh, early days of cyber, people kept saying, well, look, we figured out deterrence for uh, nuclear weapons and we haven't had a nuclear bomb uh, 
uh, dropped in angers for 75 years. In fact, we're, we're creeping up on August 6th of this year on the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima. So if it worked there, why wouldn't it work here? And the answer is that in the nuclear arena, there was a very limited number, a very limited number of countries that had nuclear weapons. Even today, there are only nine uh, that we're aware of. And uh, the, the whole concept of massive retaliation pretty well sank in on people. If you take out New York, we take out Moscow or Beijing or uh, whatever the, uh, the aggressor country was. Cyber works by different rules. It's a short of war weapon. Unlike nuclear weapons, which fortunately no one has ever used, people use cyber weapons every week, uh, sometimes every day. And because it's a short of war weapon, everybody knows that uh, countries are not willing to go use their uh, militaries in response to the theft of intellectual property, a criminal act, or even the theft of national security data. In fact, we've only seen one case in recent times in which a cyber attack has led to a military response. It had to do with the Israelis when there was a cyber attack uh, um, against the um, Israeli Defense Forces. And even then they, they took out one building, but it wasn't a sustained attack. So the result is that people think fundamentally it's worth it. And it is, because face it, if China had the choice of getting American coronavirus vaccine research versus losing a building in Houston, you know they're going to pick the vaccine research. Let me ask you this. How definitive is it? How much do we know that all of these um, hacking efforts and other things that we attribute to China are state-sponsored? And the reason I ask whether they're state-sponsored is because in a moment I want to talk to you about Huawei and I want to talk to you about TikTok and I want to talk to you about some of the other businesses that have now gotten wrapped up in this um, what seems like a deteriorating relationship and therefore are going to have some real implications on those businesses and their rivals. The answer, uh, Andrew, is we don't know for sure because for um, nuclear weapons, of course, or even a more standard military attack, um, there, you can assume that the state launched it. In the case of an attack that is taking place um, in uh, the cyber realm, it could be a state hacker, somebody working for the People's Liberation Army or the uh, intelligence agencies, or not just, just China, same true for Russia or many others. It could be a private attack, somebody who was just looking to make money. That's what those ransomware attacks you've seen so often against Baltimore and Atlanta and cities and towns across Texas last summer were all about. And the third option is that it could be a blended attack. That's what the indictment charged uh, on Tuesday, which was that you had a group of hackers who sometimes were working on their own account and sometimes were hired by, as contractors by the Ministry of State Security to go after a not usually profitable target like coronavirus vaccines or something and, and, and obtain them for the state. Um, so you may know who is hacking you, but you may not know who's, who they're working for. So with that, with that background, let me ask you and get into some of these businesses because they've been in the headlines now for more than a year in certain cases. When you think about a Huawei today, you know, Huawei will tell you that they are an independent company, they're an independent actor, uh, that they are not working at the behest of the Chinese government. Uh, right here in the United States, the view is the very opposite. Who's right? Um, very hard to tell. Uh, they are an independent company. Uh, their founder uh, was a, um, an officer, a uh, junior officer in the People's Liberation Army, but it was many years ago. Uh, he is a member of the Communist Party, but there are uh, tens of millions of members of the Communist Party, so that doesn't necessarily tell you anything. But here's what we do know. We do know that any Chinese company would be um, obligated under Chinese law to turn over data or act on behalf of the Chinese uh, intelligence services. The law is pretty clear as it was rewritten uh, a few years ago. And while Huawei went to some lengths to try to deny that they would do that, in fact, um, Chairman Zen of, of, the, of Huawei said that if he was, uh, Chairman Ren said that if he had been 
asked by the Chinese intelligence services to go do some act on their behalf, he'd rather close the company than do that. Now, people did not find that to be credible. And they particularly don't find it to be credible after the new national security law was extended to Hong Kong a few weeks ago, because that law is clearly superseding the much more liberal uh, judicial system and much more reliable judicial system that had been set up in Hong Kong. And so I think what's happened, and one of the reasons that the British followed the United States a few weeks ago in banning Huawei, was that they looked at what happened in Hong Kong and they said, this makes it even less credible that Huawei could be independent of the Chinese government in a time of conflict. And that last point is really important because you hear a lot of people saying, you know, if I speak over a Huawei network, the Chinese are gonna intercept my communications. I'm not that worried about that, Andrew. I, the Chinese seem to have done a perfectly good job of hacking us in a 3G and 4G world. They don't need 5G for that. The big concern is if you turn your network infrastructure over to a foreign power, then, and, and they're controlling it, what would happen if the order came down in a time of conflict to turn it off? And that's the big concern about Huawei. Well, let me flip it around for a moment, which is to say, if you talk to uh, certain Chinese officials, they would say to you, well, in a time of conflict, what would happen in America? What would happen in the United States if in fact there was a conflict? Don't you think that the United States government would lean heavily on companies like Cisco and Microsoft and some of our biggest tech companies that have the infrastructure and ostensibly the access uh, or have access points in a similar way that the Chinese government might with Huawei? Do you buy that? Well, they may well. And, you know, there is a legal process that we have some confidence in for this. Not 100% confidence, but as long as people are relatively confident that the government would have to go through the courts, including to uh, a special federal court that is set up for uh, intelligence issues, um, then uh, you would think, well, at least there's some protection around that. Now, there's some reason, as I suggested before, to wonder whether that court uh, exceeds too often to government claims, but there is a process there. The bigger issue, I think, is who's building your infrastructure, right? So you can't just ask Microsoft or Cisco to take over a telecommunication system, a 5G telecommunication system, in which they haven't been players before and in which you are dependent on switching systems or undersea cables that belong to a foreign actor. That's not something you can swap out right away. So then it's a question of risk. And you know, one way that I, I um, talk about this, if I'm talking to uh, you know, students in a, in a national security course I, I co-teach or something is this way. Would you let the Chinese or the Russians build your F-35 fighter? Well, clearly not. Would you let them supply uniforms to the military? Well, of course you could, would, because, you know, you can look at the uniforms and if you don't like it or you think in some way there's a problem, you can switch suppliers. And then you have to ask yourself, is a 5G network, which is much more about the internet of things than it is about your cell phone, more like an F-35 or more like uniforms? And I think the answer is, it's more like your F-35. I should mention that we're getting lots of questions uh, on this topic coming in, and Michael's going to uh, bring them to you in just a moment. We have a couple thousand people on this phone call right now, so we're hoping to be able to get to as many of them as possible. I wanted to touch on a couple of other uh, companies and topics while I have you. It's just such a great opportunity to get a personal briefing like this, if you will. Um, TikTok has been in the news. Amazon, for a brief moment, uh, tried to have its employees remove it from their phones, only to reverse themselves. How dangerous or risky does TikTok, uh, does a risk does TikTok represent in your mind? So if you think of that scale that I just mentioned, uniforms at one end, F-35s at the other, I think I would put TikTok a little closer toward the uniforms. And I would put building a 5G network, the total network, the switching systems, the undersea cables, the, the um, radio systems that you do to to communicate uh, from your cell phone to a radio tower, I'd put that closer to the F-35. Now, why do I say that? 
because uh, there are a lot of different social media platforms. There's Twitter, there's Facebook, none of them perfect as we well know. Um, but TikTok, you don't depend on for keeping your economy running in time of conflict. Now, you may determine that you don't like them as a platform of disinformation. But my overall sense is that the way you combat disinformation is with more and more accurate information. And so I get less upset about uh, TikTok, even though I'm perfectly uh, willing to recognize that there are a possible channel for disinformation, than I am about depending on the actual infrastructure you need to keep the economy and the government running. Talking about infrastructure, I wanted to talk to you about voting infrastructure uh, because there's a lot of concern that come November, um, there could be interference both from the Chinese, but increasingly you hear murmurs or speculation about the Chinese. I, I said, but from the Russians rather and the Chinese, I apologize. Uh, and, and the Iranians and the North Koreans, they're all capable of it. So, you know, Chris Krebs, who runs the... Um, uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security's um, uh, Cyber and Infrastructure Center has a good way of sort of thinking about election threats. There are threats to the infrastructure, in other words, to get at the actual voting mechanism, and there are threats to hack into voters' brains. So let's take them each in order. What's the infrastructure threat? So the one people worry about the most is the voting machines, right? And uh, I'm a little less worried about those. And the reason is that our system is so old, Andrew. It is so backward. It is so divided up across 50 states. In fact, even within a state sometimes, uh, there are different kinds of machines, that it would be very hard to hack that in a convincing way. The one exception to that is uh, what's called a perception hack. And a perception hack is a hack where you just get into a few machines say in one battleground state or in a particularly battleground district, you advertise the fact that you manipulated the vote there and then everyone assumes that you're in across the country, even if you're not. You might not even need to hack into it. You might simply declare that you have. So I'm not that worried about the machines. I am worried about the registration system. Um, the good news is that because of coronavirus, we're moving to more mail-in ballots, even if you are not absentee. The bad news is that the mail-in ballots require you to have perfect information in that registration system. So Andrew, if that ballot is mailed to you uh, in September in New York, but you're someplace else because you've displaced your family and so forth, and you're not uh, in the state, do we know that you're gonna get the ballot? Do we know that you're not gonna vote twice, right? Once in New York, once in another place. Um, so there are concerns about the registration system because that's exactly what the Russians got into four years ago. Arizona, Illinois. Actually, in the end, we determined that the Russians attacked all 50 states. They actually downloaded uh, data from the databases in a good number of them. We don't have any evidence they actually manipulated that data, but that's the worry. Is it, so that's, that's the infrastructure side. I'm sorry, go right ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, and this is a political question. Is it clear which candidate all of these com countries prefer? No. Um, you know, uh, the Russians came around to deciding that Donald Trump was uh, their best bet four years ago. I'm not sure they'd make that same calculation now. They probably would. But what do the Russians care about? They care about getting their sanctions lifted against Russia. And frankly, Donald Trump's been unable to convince his own Republican allies to vote for that in Congress. And I don't think that'll change in the next four years. Um, the Chinese, I think, would have every reason to be anti-Trump, particularly after his accusations uh, that they um, consciously um, let coronavirus spread. Uh, so it's not clear that China and Russia would be on the same side of that. The president himself has argued many times, you heard him do it just to, uh, again just last weekend, that a mail-in ballot system is an effort to rig the election against him, mostly domestically. He argues that people will collect up these ballots, that they won't go to where they're supposed to go, they'll be marking them fraudulently. There are a lot of protections against that. 
but clearly he is trying to set the stage for arguing that it was a rigged election if it's a very close one and he decides not to accept the result. He told Chris Wallace uh, uh, over the weekend that it's not clear whether he would accept the result. Final question for me, and then we're going to open it up. And I know Michael's got so many questions and people are uh, just waiting to get to them. But, uh, you know, we've talked now a lot about our adversaries using technology against us. I'm curious about how you think the United States and our allies are using tech against others. Well, that's a really um, great question. So, um, the United States has uh, a very active uh, U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, and uh, has the National Security Agency. And uh, in August of uh, 2018, two years ago, President Trump signed a still classified order that allows the United States much more um, leeway to go off and uh, conduct short of war attacks against adversaries without going to the President of the United States for approval. Until August of 2018, if you wanted to launch a nuclear weapon or a cyber weapon, you needed the direct clearance from the U.S. president. And you can imagine what it took to go get that. Now, uh, Paul Makassoni, the general who runs U.S. Cyber Command, can do a fair bit all by himself and maintains that that's what he did in the effort in 2018 to push back against the Internet Research Agency during the midterm elections, to push back against uh, Russian intelligence. And uh, we have evidence, uh, which we've described in other time stories, that uh, the United States has used technology to uh, go after North Korea's missile launches, Iran's uh, missile launches, and to put malware inside Russia's electric grid in a very noisy public way to make it clear to the Russians, you want to have your hacking tools inside our grid? Well, just know that if the power goes off here, it's going to go off there as well. So we have a pretty active U.S. Cyber Command. U.S. companies are banned by law from hacking back, and I think that's a good idea because if a U.S. company went after a firm that had attacked it or a country that attacked it, the receiving country wouldn't know whether that was action by the United States government or by a private firm or by a private firm on behalf of the U.S. government. You could start a cyber war without anyone in Washington even knowing that it was happening. Um, and then you have the more complicated question of how countries may be using devices that are out there for surveillance. And, you know, the Chinese don't trust um, Apple iPhones. And we certainly have banned Huawei iPhones for fear that data would be uh, sent off. We had a very good story in the Times today about Chinese made um, uh, drones, just the kind that you would you uh, that, that consumers yep. buy and whether or not that data is shoveled off to the Chinese government. Well, many countries in Europe and elsewhere, even our allies ask the same question about our equipment. David, I want to thank you uh, so much for answering my questions, uh, but now I want you to answer everybody else's, and so we'll let everyone have a shot on goal. Michael's been uh, doing a masterful job sorting through them. I'm watching them come in on the screen. Michael. Thanks, Andrew, and thank you, David. This has been an incredibly enlightening conversation, and yeah, we've got a ton of reader questions, um, but I'm going to take a prerogative and ask one of my own um, to start off with, which is how would a Biden administration's approach to this uh, new Cold War differ from the Trump administration's? That's a really great question, uh, Michael, because um, at the beginning of the, of the year, um, both President Trump and, uh, and former Vice President Biden were going out of their way to make the argument that they would be the tougher one on China. And uh, at this time, at that time, you may recall, President Trump was praising President Xi uh, for being transparent about uh, coronavirus and saying that he was going to have a really great trade deal and that he had a really great relationship with Xi. And you heard Biden being sort of the China hawk. I think as we get closer to Election Day, you're going to see 
um, both candidates try to outdo themselves on how hawkish they'd be on China. And that's going to put either, uh, that's going to put both of them in a, in a pretty tight box uh, after the election. Now, we've seen this before. Bill Clinton called the Chinese government the butchers of Beijing during his campaign for the presidency and ended up being the president who brought them into the World Trade Organization. That was a pretty big flip, basically 180 degrees. Um, we've seen that President Trump is entirely capable of taking something that he refers to as a non-negotiable national security issue like 5G networks and then turning around a few weeks later and saying, well, it's all up for grabs if I get a good enough trade deal. And so I think that gives Biden an opportunity to go after him. But the China that Joe Biden would inherit should he win in November is a very different China than the one he last saw on January 20th, 2017, when he left office. Because China now has made it clear that they are in a competition for significant dominance and pushback on American power, whether it is in the South China Sea, whether it's in the realm of, of aid to um, NATO allies, who he thinks he can peel away, whether it's uh, in the coronavirus territory. He has made clear that he believes this is China's moment. And that took the... Um, veterans of the Obama administration by surprise. They thought that she would bide his time, focus on internal reform, and not challenge the United States. And they were wrong. All right, thank you for that. Um, a question that's been on the minds of multiple readers, including Jay Town and Harold is, essentially, do you see the world sort of dividing into sort of American tech and Chinese tech, especially with regards to 5G? And if so, how would countries align themselves? Is it even possible to align yourself with an American 5G system or a Chinese 5G system or an American tech system and a Chinese tech system? Well, it's a great question because um, you could argue that splinter net has already happened that we're already seeing two internets develop. Uh, a Chinese controlled, heavily censored internet in which countries can buy a 5G system from China through Huawei, have the facial recognition that is being used in Hong Kong or against the Muslim populations in China or throughout Chinese cities thrown in nearly for free. In other words, you could buy a 5G system that is designed for social control, or you could, you could buy a Western system uh, that is not. Uh, where it gets murky, as your question suggests, is what happens with the traffic that runs around the world over multiple networks? Because let's face it, we can congratulate ourselves for banning Huawei from the United States or from convincing the Brits to ban it from their networks or perhaps convincing the rest of Europe, if that happens, to ban Huawei. And still Huawei will control 40% of the world's telecommunications. So if Andrew and I are communicating or you and I are communicating uh, over uh, any kind of email system, Slack system, uh, what we're doing right now over Zoom, over social media, the chances are a good deal of it's going to run through a Chinese switch somewhere in the world. And so we have to make a fundamental decision. Decision one is, do you want to let the Chinese own a good part of your, inter of your uh, infrastructure? But decision two is, even if you say we're going to ban them, are we going to learn how to live in a dirty network? Live in a network where we can't control every node. Got it. Um, several readers, including Charles, are asking, who are the U.S.'s closest allies in, uh, in terms of coordinating with um, these cyber issues and cyber attacks? And a lot of readers are also asking, where does Europe fit into this picture, given that there is a bit more tension between um, uh, the Trump administration and various European governments? It's a terrific question. So our closest allies on cyber issues are what are called the five eyes. And those are the countries that cooperate the most on intelligence and particularly in signals intelligence. And they're the English speaking victors of uh, World War II. So it's the United States, Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And don't, um, 
downgrade the import of the Australians and of New Zealand uh, because those are critical nodes in the Pacific, as you can imagine. But even there, you saw tensions. It was six months ago that the British government announced that they were going to keep Huawei in parts of their system because they were fearful, frankly, that the Chinese would go retaliate against British imports. That's a much bigger concern in Europe. And the Germans, for example, uh, have not decided or announced publicly whether they would allow Huawei to build a big part of the German network. And Deutsche Telekom is such the dominating provider in Europe that that's a very, very big decision. Uh, we have seen in the coronavirus uh, uh, times a few um, uh, uh, sort of more fringe members or newer members of uh, the European uh, alliances and embrace the Chinese who came in with more aid, more soft power, maybe that 5G system than we did. And so I think the next few years are going to be about the inroads the Chinese believe they can make against some NATO members. And by the way, that's what the Russians are trying as well, just not as effectively. Um, now, Abdullah asks, what could China's retaliation, um, you know, in response to uh, the closure of the Houston consulate look like? Well, if they decide to stick to the sort of old uh, uh, diplomatic niceties, they would close a consulate of ours. And actually, Houston is a um, sister city of Wuhan, and our consulate in Wuhan is closed already, uh, or, or was uh, as the virus spread. So it's possible if they don't want to make a big issue of it, that they'll just leave it at that and just say, you're not reopening the Wuhan consulate until we get to reopen Houston. Um, I suspect that they will go further than that. And uh, I suspect that you will not see much of a diminishment of the kind of hacking that's come out of or supported by the Ministry of State Security and, and others because I think they're going to want to prove that these kind of techniques will not intimidate them. You know, part of the problem with indicting people is that if they live abroad, uh, they're not likely to see the inside of a, of a uh, American courtroom. Uh, certainly none of the 12 um, Russian officers who were indicted for election interference have stood trial. None of the PLA officers who uh, ran Unit 61398, a unit that Mandiant uh, and, the, and the Times exposed uh, back in 2013, uh, have uh, had to stand trial, although they've been indicted. So uh, it's very possible that the Chinese will sort of shake this off and keep doing what they're doing. Um, so uh, this question comes in from an anonymous listener. Um, the, uh, the Trump administration has warned you know, about Chinese students who might be acting as spies to steal research and secrets. Um, how have or should U.S. schools and companies sort of react to that? How, how big of a worry is it and what could they do if, if it is a serious concern? This is a really hard problem because um, I'm convinced that you know, one of the greatest forms of soft power strength in the United States is in fact our university system. The fact that the world wants to come here to study uh, and frequently wants to stay uh, and, and work in American companies is one of our great strengths. And when you just think of the tech companies that were started by immigrants from Andy Grove starting Intel, to, of course, uh, Sergey Brin and others starting Google. I mean, the list goes on and on. And you see it in the number of um, first generation uh, uh, families and, and executives who are now running major um, tech firms. So uh, to cut us off from Chinese students or students from other countries, I think would be a huge error for the United States. That said, uh, I can imagine why you may want to go deny visas to somebody who was trained in a PLA university and who clearly appears to be actively working for the Chinese military or intelligence services. And um, you've seen some indictments in recent times of uh, Chinese officers who came in under false pretenses. 
One of my biggest fears, though, is that you turn university campuses into a McCarthyite uh, location for these investigations, where people are going deep into into email systems and elsewhere, suspecting that just because you came from China, you're necessarily working as a spy. And, you know, for the 99 point something percentage of Chinese students who are just here to be students, that is already a big problem. All right. Um, Gabe has a question um, sort of related, again, related to the Houston concert, which is, why is it important or even useful for, you know, foreign hackers, you know, possibly working for um, state governments to have a base of operations in this country, you know, like the consulate? Isn't the idea of hacking that it can be done from anywhere in the world? So what was the special significance of the uh, consulate in Houston? No, I doubt very much of the hacking took place. The question is exactly right. Uh, from that consulate. They want to have a human presence here in the United States because there's some things you can collect from human intelligence, just as we have CIA stations around the world, and that's to be uh, expected. Um, so throwing out the occupants of the Houston uh, consulate uh, and making the argument that most of them are diplomat or spies just in the guise of diplomats may make you feel good. I don't think in the end it's going to make that big a difference and probably isn't all that directly related to the hacking issues. They may be spying in, in other ways, but probably not by cyber means because it's a lot safer and a lot easier to do that from offshore. So, you know, to some degree, as I wrote this morning, this is applying a 19th century solution to a 21st century problem, and we shouldn't be surprised that it doesn't work. Got it. Um, Rena asks sort of a broad question, which I found pretty interesting, which is that, um, you know, before the pandemic, face-to-face -face communication was valued because it was seen as more secure than sort of digital communication. But in our new world, which has sort of transformed how we communicate, um, just how much more inherently risky um, is our general environment? Um, you know, uh, and is this, has the script changed? You know, have there been enough steps to render digital communication more secure than face-to-face -face or as secure? Just what are the broader implications of sort of how the pandemic has reshaped our lives? Well, it's a terrific question because as the world moves more digitally, obviously you create new vulnerabilities. This is deeply on the minds of the people who mined our nuclear weapons because for the first 70 years, our nuclear force was being run through basically old tech communications. And as it's being upgraded, as it desperately needs to be, there's a tendency to make those systems more digital and thus introduce new vulnerabilities. What the nuclear world is discovering, American companies discovered long ago. Um, if your researchers are collaborating across time zones, they're going to be doing it in digital form. And of course, that creates a vulnerability. So what's the way around that? Well, the first way around that is much more effective uh, encryption. There's a reason people are using apps like Signal and others that offer very uh, good encryption uh, uh, to them. But we also have a US government that is deeply divided on this question, because while on the one hand, it wants to encourage users, whether they're corporations or their own um, officials to use the most secure communications possible, they also want to build in legal back doors so that if the police or the FBI or an American intelligence agency needs to get inside through a system run by a big telecommunications operator or an internet services company, a provider, that they can do so. And uh, in the 2016 campaign, the one issue on which uh, you saw Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton on the same side was the need for legal access to encrypted systems. I would argue that the events of the past couple of years have shown us that we need better and better encryption. And the problem with providing legal access is that if you create that porthole in the system, the Chinese or the Russians or someone else will find a way to exploit it. And uh, 
the Trump administration, for all of its bluster on these issues, has not come out with a clear policy on encryption because they can't decide this issue themselves. David, right. thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, David. Uh, Andrew, over to you. Absolutely, and Michael, thank you for for navigating through all of those questions. David, we just want to say thank you uh, once again. Uh, this was a very special conversation, a timely and important one. And we hope to come on back um, because I know as the year progresses, these issues are only going to get more and more complicated. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, always great to be with you. And uh, yes, you're right. This is going to be a pretty wild year on this because of Corona vaccine, because of the elections, and because it's just the way the world is moving. Okay. Well, thank you, David. And we, uh, we look forward to our next conversation with you. Uh, in the meantime, just want to let uh, everybody who's on the call know that uh, there's a full slate of digital events that take place, including next week, next week's installment of uh, Dealbook Debrief with Tom Friedman, who's going to join us once again. And uh, to check all of that out, you can go to timesevents.nytimes.com. Of course, as we said at the beginning, we will make a replay of this conversation available in the newsletter tomorrow on nytimes.com, and we'll push it out on social as well. In the meantime, um, stay sane, stay safe, and we'll all talk to you very soon again. Thanks so much.